Powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Now, live from inside the Matt Black Kia Studios, it's Football at Four. And Football at Four is powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Adam Kaplan, Jeff Mosher. You can listen to the podcast Mondays and Thursdays during the offseason. It drops on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and the offseason will be over shortly, Adam Kaplan. We will be getting into training camp before we know it. You know why? You know why I know that, Adam Kaplan? Because I was sitting on the beach this weekend, and the beach goes too quickly. Beach season goes by too quickly, which means football season is just about here. Yeah, Mike, good to be with you. Yeah, no doubt about it. In fact, next week is it for their offseason program. In fact, uh, the Eagles, for the second straight year, will be the first team done. Now, the Eagles and Bengals are the only two teams that are not doing mandatory camps. It's kind of weird. I... Uh, we're just perusing the, the schedules last week because you, you, you mentioned the schedules last Friday. I want to see if those were accurate. And what we, you know, what I learned was, okay, the Bengals are, they're also not doing a mandatory camp, uh, which is, you know, the, the, the runner up for the Super Bowl, the team that got in to the Super Bowl that didn't win it. Uh, they are also not doing a mandatory camp, but the Eagles, Mike, are the first team done. The Bengals will go through the middle of the month where the Eagles are done next Wednesday, and they uh, work uh, today. They work Thursday, Friday, then Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of next week, and I should be there. Uh, I look forward to going because uh, uh, it's our last chance to see them before training camp. Yeah, so no mandatory camp. This is the second straight year. I think, if memory serves, that Nick Sirianni uh, kind of made a deal with the players to kind of, you know, hey, I'll do, I won't do this if you do that. Uh, how what, right. what happened here that there, this is not mandatory? Yeah, it's, it's, it's similar. Yes, that's true. It's the same agreement to get the players to show up because at non-mandatory stuff, I don't care how old you are. If you're a rookie or if you're a 15-year vet, you don't have to show up. But uh, they, the players agree to this. And plus, the other thing is, the, the other part of this is uh, the Eagles are big into sports science, as the Rams are. Uh, they got Ted Rath from the Rams. And the Rams have the best injury situation in the National Football League over the last five years by data. And that's a part of this. So it, if you mix it all in, it all makes sense. And this is why they're doing it. And look, their injury situation was not as bad as other. Not only were they, in terms of soft tissue and, and injuries, they're in the, the, the top ten of least players listed on the injury report each week. That I look at that stuff. That's really important. It tells you how much guys are going to practice and not practice and how much they practice. So whatever they did last season is working. I expect them to do the same thing this season. Right, so uh, they're out there today, right? Yeah, so by schedule, it is Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. Next week, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And, you know, it's funny. Some you're not, You don't practice over the weekend. That's one of the, the agreements in the CBA. But some teams want to do it Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. The players want off Friday. It's just a matter of what. Not every team has the same, same OTA schedule. Uh, they're, now, there are only a certain amount of days are allowed to practice by the CBA. But that, that's the way it is. Right. So there's six practices, uh, kind of. Yeah. There's nothing heavy going on. There's no pads, nothing to that extent. These six, and then that's it till training camp? Yeah. Oh, yeah. By the way, there's no 11-on-11. 11 11. I'm glad you mentioned that. So you can do 7-on-7. Seven seven. But the, the key is, and this is what – just talking to coaches around the NFL over the years about this, particularly lately. They want to see who's behind, who's learning. It's, it's really – the OTAs are super important for the – first, second, and third-year players. After that, once you're vested, this is why so many players don't show up or they show up very little for OTAs. But this particular team, because of the agreement with their head coach, uh, they, they're showing up. So it's super important for young players, Mike, to retain the information they've been given. When you're a rookie or, or, or a guy who now is expected to play more than they did last year, let's say you're a, a bench guy or now you're competing for a, a, an important job, whether it's top backup or starter, you need to retain the information that you've gotten in the offseason and then apply it to the field. And the other part of this, is, which is not a, really talked about enough, is this is what a head coach told me recently. You want to see where these guys are physically, what kind of shape they showed up in. Because, yes, you, could, you might see them in the building, but you're not allowed to coach them when they're inside the building. That's the rules of the starting the 11 CBA coming out of the, the lockout mic. Players did not want to be coached in the building when they weren't practicing on the field. They, they were done with that. 
Uh, the owners were loving that because anything that doesn't involve money, they don't. They were they're happy to give that up. So you, you want this is their, their this is their way to find out if players are in shape because when I first started covering the league, Mike, these guys would come in so early in late March and early April. You know, you 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 would get a better idea. Now they're seeing a little bit later in 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 April and May what kind of shape these guys are in, and then I, and again for the younger players to what they're learning has been like. Right, so you got seven on seven for the most part. Practice is light. So, what are the teams trying to accomplish by having these guys in? What are they trying to get done with these, you know, light practices? Anything in particular? Is there anything here, you know, that that they take going into training camp? Yeah. See, so seven on seven is a pure passing drill. You can run out of it, but that's not why they use it. Talking to coaches over the years, it's pure passing. Uh, in terms of what they want to get out of it, you're looking for timing. Rhythm. In this case, in particular, with Jalen Hurts, you want to see, though you're not in pads and you can't hit, you can never hit a quarterback anyway, but yeah. there's only so much physicality that you can have. You're not really just a touch. You, you can't tackle. You can't hit. But there's certain things that you can do with timing, and you're looking to see the route running from the young receivers and the tight ends. And then it's just getting the timing down with receivers. And, 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 and the other part about this is, they're good, because this is Sirianni's second year calling plays, we'll stick with the offense for now. And we'll get to Gannon a little bit later. You're looking to see if your reporter, like Mosher and I, will be there next week. I'm looking to see if there are any differences because we saw certain things in training camp. Just to get an idea, because we're not exposed to Sirianni as a play caller or as a head coach, and, and none of these coaches really, quite frankly, or very few of them. We wanted to see what they were going to bring in from a from a coaching standpoint, how they coached, how hard they coached. And by the way, Sirianni is a guy that will yell. He'll, he'll get after his guys, which I love, to be honest with you. I, I, I like that. Uh, you you want to see if they're getting it. And it's and then the footwork, I'll give you another give you a nugget here. So in the 18 OTAs, it was our first experiencing Jordan Mailata because he was in the rookie camp the first time he put on a helmet. But then in the OTA sessions, and then the mandatory camp, I know I know he didn't know what he was doing. But I remember talking to someone in the front office then. I said, if you guys could ever get this kid to figure it out, my goodness gracious. It, it, yeah. Because he's a super freak athlete. He didn't know anything about football. But this is where coaching matters. I know that there's no jobs on the line here. That That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about player development. Yeah. And coaching and getting on the field and showing how guys to line up, him in particular, how they do things at the National Football League level. Going from college, Mike, where coaching is not nearly as good as this level, and, ha- and these players have to get used to be- be- being taught, no question about it. Yeah, and I would think, I mean, you could probably comment on this more if coaches have ever mentioned this to you, a guy that maybe isn't on your radar, maybe he can at least get on the radar. Hey, I want to see this guy who I didn't have any anticipation for when we get on the field for yeah. OTAs. Like, sure. this guy stood out to me in this 7-on-7. Seven seven. Now I really want to see more of him when we get to August. That, too, and then there's there, there's stories like Jamie Newman. You remember Jamie Newman last year? Yeah, the quarterback. Terrible, yeah, terrible in their OTAs. And I, there was so much hype on him. And I remember we, we, we did our show after OTAs were over, and we kind of dropped the nugget that he probably wasn't going to make it. I, I can't remember when they cut him, but I just know he was awful. And the crazy thing about Jamie Newman is he never was with another team. It's I don't know what happened to him. I, oh, oh, I think he might be in the CFL, but... But I'm talking about another NFL team. I mean, that you really have to be bad at quarterback. Think about it, Mike. Uh, Mike, in this this league, which has trouble developing backup quarterbacks, he couldn't even get with another team. It's kind of hard to believe. Yeah, but no, true. That, that's an interesting uh, point about that. The fact that, and I guess you'll see uh, Carson Strong, some yep. of these young guys, especially the skill position players, for that first time out there to see what kind of uh, you know how they retain and how they kind of process everything. And uh, here's one, A.J. Brown. So I was at their camp in uh, 2019, Brown's first season. Uh, you know, he was a rookie in 2019 with the Titans. I just remember, I know he's not tall. He's around 6'1". But there's just something about him that stands out when you look at all their the receivers. And that's what I want to see here. And I know he and Jalen Hurts are super close. They're best friends. But that doesn't have anything to do with them playing football together. So... I want to see how they play together at this level, how they practice together. And then, then, as you said, Jordan Davis, you're looking forward to see 
just how well he moves and uh, we'll, we'll find out from our sources uh, what the technique is like because for him to get on the field, being a first-round pick will not get him on the field. If he doesn't know what he's doing, I remember Mike Zimmer telling me this. Uh, Zim told me that he didn't care how much the guy's getting paid. If you don't know the, the D-line techniques, you don't get on the field. It's just And, and by the way, for, for a rookie running back, not that they have any, but if you're a running back that's young and you can't pass block, you don't know who to pick up, you're not getting on the field. It's It's... That's oh. just the way it is, and that's the kind of stuff that I'm looking for. Yeah, and we've seen that a lot over the last couple of years, guys who have problems picking up blitzes uh, and that kind of stuff. And then if you uh, can't block and can't get on the field, you might get cut, and the NFL released their cut-down dates, which uh, you know have oh, yeah. changed a little bit over the years. Yeah, so for the second straight year, and this has a lot to do with COVID, the COVID situation and uh, what teams have been dealing with. You know, For many years, they went with the, the major, the major cut-down from – 90 to 53, which is kind of ridiculous to drop 37 players on, on within 24 hours. And then the last couple of years, they went with three or four cutdown dates. This year, they're doing three. So the first one that you have to pay attention to is, and they do these on Tuesday. The team likes having deadlines on Tuesday for some reason, so they're doing it on Tuesday. The first one is August 16th, a Tuesday, from 90 to 85 players. And that's after the first preseason game. In this case, Mike, the Eagles are at home. Their only home preseason game. It's so funny that they're they're not playing the Jets in the last preseason game. It's absolutely the first this year. And Joe Douglas and the Jets. And then that one's on Friday, August the 12th. And then four days later, they'll have to get down to 85. And knowing the Eagles, they're, they're one of the first teams to cut players. I'd be shocked if some of those, na- those, those names don't leak out after a 24-48 hour period. And then the second one is a week from then, August 23rd. They go from 85 to 80 players, and that's after the second preseason game of the Eagles. That second preseason game is a very odd day. I can't remember the last time. Maybe someone listening knows, but I don't remember when the Eagles ever played a Sunday afternoon at 1 p.m. preseason game uh, at Cleveland, by the way. Yeah. I may go to that because I think that's where that would have joined practice. Um, that one's at 1 p.m., and then two days later. Oh, and also it's 4 p.m. Eastern. Each cutdown day, it's got to be done. Then finally, on August 30th, again, a Tuesday, from 80 to 53, and that's after the third preseason game, which is the final one. Remember, the last two years, we only have three preseason games. And that third one is at Miami. That's a Saturday. Again, the, the, the Sunday last week, this is also a weekend. Saturday, August 27th. And then they have to be down uh, three days later, Tuesday at 4 p.m. Eastern. That's when we get down to the 53. And after that, practice squads. Speaking of that, practice squads now have been increased by two from 14 to 16. This is really good. This is what the, the, the NFL Players Association wanted. And the other part about this, and there's other stuff, we'll get into the IR, IR, IR rules. But you could cut, you could um, elevate a player three times without signing off the practice squad. That's really important, with Mike, because when you sign a player off the practice squad, you must cut them first if they're not vested. That means they have to go through waivers first. When you elevate them, there's no waivers. What happens is if you play on a Sunday, they get reinstated to the the uh, practice squad the following day. Right. So there are some new IR rules uh, that we, you know, you kind of touched on right there, and some practice squad rules. They have been amended. Is this COVID stuff that they just kept in? Well, it's funny, and I knew this would be the case because it was so obvious. There's not a team that didn't like the the IR rule. Because remember, for many years, this is going back in the early 2000s, if you put a guy on IR, he was done. That's it. He's out for the season. Then we had, I think, eight or nine weeks. And then two years ago, they went to four games. You could return on after four games. This Excuse me. They, last year, it was three games, which no one was cheating or anything, but the league thought that was pretty light. So the new agreement is you can return after four games, not weeks. Four games have to lapse on your schedule. Then you then you could come back and play. So that's good. The return to play is four weeks. That also counts for the non-football injury or non-football illness list. So that's good. Uh, but the, 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 we, we were talking about this on Inside the Birds uh, yesterday, Mike is that last year, and this this was bad, you, if you were put on IR twice, you could not return. This year, you can return if you've been put on IR twice, 
with this council, the maximum number of players that can come back from IR, which is eight, and that includes practice squad injury reserve, which is rarely used. Teams don't like using that. So you, it, there is a little bit of gamesmanship on having strategy, uh, how you use these uh, guys on IR and just understand that you cannot bring a player back more than twice off of injury reserve. Uh, talk with Adam Kaplan, of course, uh, the Inside the Birds podcast. You can listen to that on all your podcast platforms. One of the things you guys talked about on the podcast, too, was um, we touched a little bit on Friday, but some new stuff, uh, Brandon Hunt, Hallaby, oh, yeah. John Ferrari, uh, all the roles of this new front office. Uh, are we getting anything clear over the Memorial Day weekend? Mike, I could just tell you, and we, we, we put a lot of information out that we've not talked about on your show before anywhere. Um, Alec Halaby is getting a promotion. He's, he's our at, their analytics director. He's supposedly pretty good at it. Um, so it's funny. I talked to some analytic guys uh, around the league who know him or know the, how the Eagles do analytics, and they love it. They, uh, this is kind of where we first heard it, that he was going to get a promotion of some sort. I guess these guys know each other or something. Or the analytic community is very close in any way. Uh, the word that we received is he's going to get some sort of promotion. We don't know how much say he's going to have. We know that analytics has a big role in player evaluation. That's been since Joe Banner had the team, but or was the president. But what Joe told us in Inside the Birds last year, this floored us. Like, this was sort of breaking news that not enough people picked up. Joe said analytics were rarely, if at all, used for, for drafts. He didn't like it for that. He said very little, if at all, in his recollection when he was with the Eagles. He didn't like it for that. He liked it for game day planning. And we know the Eagles were great in that in 2017. Uh, yeah, coaches planning, uh, player evaluation in season and free agency. But he just didn't see the value in it as much as the draft. Right. Because you can overvalue, uh, Mike, you can overvalue height, weight, and speed and all that stuff. Yeah, I, I know uh, we, we kind of touched on this on Friday. You guys talked about it on the Inside the Birds podcast, but, man, the, the amount of turnover and ch- may, maybe oh, the beginning of the change in philosophy a little bit more, as you kind of said, heavier on analytics. And, and we don't hear that word as much in football, it seems like, as much as it's infiltrated say, baseball, for instance, uh, which has really ripped that sport apart from the fan base. We don't hear it as much in football, but how prevalent is analytics in the NFL right now? Big, um, and it's funny, don't let Bill Belichick fool you. He had Ernie Adams, who was his advanced uh, matchups director. He had a he just retired. He was sort of like the secret sauce to their statistical department, and Belichick could say whatever he wants, but they they used a data and advanced information for decades on Ernie Adams, who was terrific at what he does. In fact, you could see, it might be on a football life. I know one of the... Patriots documentaries, Ernie Adams was shown and, and, and talked about. Actually, they talked to him. Uh, but the fact of the matter is every team uses them some more than others. The Eagles are very analytical. Believe it or not, the Bills are very analytical. Uh, talking to multiple people with the Bills over the years. So, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. I We, we don't know. Another part of it, we there, people want a percentage. I have no idea. There's no way to put a percentage. And I don't know how much more they'll do it, but – when you promote a analytics director, and who knows what the title is going to be called, uh, you have to think that'll be more important. But how important, how they do it, we'll, have, we'll learn more about in the coming days and weeks. And remember, they haven't announced any of these promotions that we've reported or yeah. any other anyone else has reported. So we, we look forward to the titles. We always get a kick out of what titles they give, Mike, because a lot of the titles that te- not only the Eagles, the teams give, they, they're not reflective of what the people do. Like, like Brandon Hunt, you mentioned was a pro scouting coordinator. That's not what he did. He was the pro director. He direct, He was the one who would oversee all the pro scouting, so it's a little misleading sometimes with these these titles. Yeah. Um, real quick, we know uh, tomorrow is the infamous June 1. Yeah. Uh, any uh, casualties you think? Uh, I know Mike Kay over at Pro Football Network has mentioned Isaac Sayamala's name uh, in some of his reporting. Uh, any guys you think June 1 we're going to see, or is that all – kind of taken care of well post june one cuts they've it's extremely rare because these the reason why the post june one designation was put in and agreed to decades ago because the nflpa said hey listen we'll give you we'll agree to you getting cap relief if you cut these players early so that's what the post june one designation is is and then you get on june 2nd you get cap relief so the eagles will get a we'll get some cap relief with fletcher cox's post one uh post June 1 designation. 
No, I should say, Mo, that would shock me if they cut him. I was uh, shocked to see his name mentioned, but his reasoning made some sense. I mean, from, from, well, let's put it this way. That what we've said inside the birth for, for I don't know how many months now. If he does not win the job, how in the world could you justify Isaac Sayamalo and his salary? He'd be the highest paid backup guard in the National Football League. He's on the final year of his deal. He is going to make, Mike, this season $4.978 million. So basically $5 million to be a backup. You can't do that. Uh, he's a very good football player, but has had major injury issues. Uh, we'll see where it goes. I'd, I'd, I'd be surprised because he's just got, you know, he goes in the never say never bucket in terms of being released. I, I don't see it, but they, they would they would save. Uh, there would be about two two million in dead money, but in cash they'd save nearly five million and uh, save about oh just under three million in cash space. But I mean, they don't need the cash space at this point. But stranger things have happened. All right, Adam Kaplan, if something does happen, you know the guys will be talking about it on Inside the Birds, and uh, they'll have more at InsideTheBirds.com. New podcasts will drop uh, Thursday. Uh, You can get that on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. Check out their platform, Q&A, Adam and Jeff, and everything else. Q&A tomorrow. Yep, 6 a.m. Quentin Michael and Jason Vaughn back. What an unbelievable two shows they've had since they've been back, particularly last week's. They broke down... Uh, the defense, and then they're doing offense, and it's um, it's phenomenal, and it's super inside like we, we were hoping, and they're, they're phenomenal. So Quentin Michael and Jason Vaughn back tomorrow with Q&A on pod and all podcasting platforms at 6 a.m. Eastern. All right, and the Eagles back on the field uh, later on this week. Uh, we'll have more during Football at 4. Adam, thanks, bud. Thanks, man. All right, Adam Kaplan here, Football at 4, Sports Bash Live, 97.3 ESPN.